These exquisite sculptures are some of the finest examples of brass sculpture from the Kingdom of Benin, made between the 15th and 19th centuries. But far from being displayed in their intended location, the Royal Palace of Benin, they're scattered around the world, in museums in cities like London, Berlin, and New York. The truth is these sculptures, known as the Benin Bronzes, were looted by British colonial troops in an incredibly violent attack that killed many innocent people and destroyed the city of Benin and left a huge gash on an entire society and culture. In fact, 90% of Africa's cultural heritage is located outside of the continent. Today, calls to return the Benin Bronzes are increasing, both in Nigeria, where Benin City is located, and increasingly in the Western countries which house these artifacts in their museums. So why should the sculptures be returned? And why are institutions like the British Museum so reluctant to let them go? We'll take a look at all of this before finally exploring the future the bronzes could have if they returned to Nigeria. The Kingdom of Benin was founded in the 13th century. Since then, kings called Olas have reigned over the Benin people since Ewari I's reign began in 1440, and the successive line of Obas continues to this day. The craft of brass artwork is part of a long tradition of bronze casting called lost wax, which has been passed down from father to son over the generations. These were used for rituals and to record the history of the kingdom. Over 1,000 brass plaques were fitted to the columns of the royal palace of Benin, along with ancestral shrines featuring carved ivory tusks and brass heads meant to embody the spirits of ancestors like former kings and queens. Benin artworks were also made of wood or coral. For hundreds of years, these royal and sacred artworks were displayed in the royal palace in the city of Benin. Some pieces had sacred or ritual purposes, like recording interactions with gods, honoring ancestors, or a new oba. The Portuguese arrived in the area in the 15th century and traded peacefully with the Benin people for centuries, notably trading palm oil and enslaved people, but more on that later. In 1884, a major conference was held in Berlin where France, Germany, Portugal, and Britain carved up parts of Africa on a map plotting where to establish colonies. By this point, the city of Benin had over 50,000 inhabitants. Soon after the Berlin Conference, Britain established colonies like the Oil Rivers Protectorate in what's now southern Nigeria, while the Royal Niger Company was established to exploit territory around the Niger River, including Benin City. Armed with new technology like the Maxine gun, a machine gun-like weapon, the Royal Niger Company's English employees and their African troops destroyed several towns and villages along the river in attacks they termed, quote, punitive expeditions. In 1894, a trade dispute with a local chief was used to justify an attack on the village of Broemi. Meanwhile, Benin's power had waned due to royal power struggles and civil war, making it harder to resist the push by British interests for more control over trade on the territory. Three years after Broemi, the British attacked the city of Benin in a similar fashion but more on that in a moment. The version of events you're likely to hear in Western museums is a story carefully crafted by the British to justify their attack and paint themselves as victims. But while the British story has spread around the world, it turns out to be false. The evidence the attack was planned is substantial. In January 1897, just a month before the British attacked Benin City, the Times of London interviewed Sir Alfred Jepson, a former British colonial official, who said revealingly, quote, it has always been recognized that eventually Benin City must be taken. For additional evidence of a premeditated attack, author Dan Hicks cites years of complaints about trade requesting government approval for an attack. As Professor Osar Hieme Osadolor, a Nigerian history and international studies professor points out, the British were eager to exploit natural resources, which would cover the cost of their invasion. After the attack, additional justification was added by a sensationalized British press claiming that human sacrifice and slavery were rampant in the city. While these did exist to some extent, they were heavily exaggerated. But Saisonor Godfrey Ekator Obogie, a Nigerian researcher at the Institute for Benin Studies, suggests that Europeans confused human sacrifice with execution of prisoners. Dan Hicks highlights the hypocrisy that the British profited from the slave trade for centuries, only ending it in the Caribbean in 1838, but now blamed Africans for the problem. But now that you understand the context, let's examine what happened. In January 1897, a team of nine British traders and officials and hundreds of African servants came to the city of Guato near Benin, requesting to speak with the Oba about a trade treaty. However, their visit coincided with the Igwe festival, an annual festival where non-Benin people are forbidden. The British were aware that foreigners were forbidden, and they were warned that they would be killed if they tried to approach any further. 
And yet, they continued on anyway, and at least four Europeans, plus hundreds of their servants, were killed. But a few members of the team escaped. The news of the killing quickly reached British newspapers, and just days after the attack, the British press had established the narrative of a massacre to justify what would happen next, a punitive expedition. And so, the killing of these four Englishmen was used to justify an attack on the city of Benin in February 1897, with 5,000 men, including soldiers and carriers, plus 10 navy ships. Armed with Maxim guns, the soldiers split into groups with orders to quote, destroy all towns along the way. Although the Benin soldiers had guns, the British had forbidden rifles and other advanced weapons to be traded in the area, so they were technologically outmatched. The British killed scores of Benin soldiers and civilians, indiscriminately firing their machine guns into the jungle. They didn't even bother to count how many people died, saying that it was quote, impossible to estimate. The entire city of Benin, including houses, ceremonial buildings, and the royal palace, were destroyed, and its treasures looted. Where the palace had stood, the British built a fort and a prison, and the Oba was sent into exile, cementing British rule over the territory. Less than six months later, in July 1897, Benin bronzes started appearing in London museums. Dan Hicks describes a bronze's arrival in an Oxford museum, saying, quote, The effect was to show an ancient living culture, freshly destroyed, as if it were nothing but archaeological remains. The indiscriminate, extreme violence, and premeditated nature of the attacks are generally left out of the British telling of events, but these details are critical to understanding what really happened. And the violent theft of the Benin bronzes underscores why they should be returned. Dan Hicks, curator of world archaeology at the University of Oxford's Museum of Anthropology, wrote the book Brutish Museums, arguing strongly for restitution. According to Hicks, the violent act of looting the Benin bronzes and other artwork is an unfinished event, still ongoing until the art is returned to its rightful owners. Hicks argues that the extreme violence carried out by the British in the punitive expeditions of the late 1800s was a precursor to the violence of the 20th century. For this reason, he refers to it as World War Zero. Hicks states that since extreme violence against civilians, destruction of cities, and looting of cultural objects was banned by the Hague Convention of 1899, just two years after the Benin attack, that quote, even at the end of the 19th century, the world was aware that these acts were wrong. On the other hand, sociologist Stephanie Jenkins argues that repatriation is merely a political statement that doesn't make up for past wrongs. Jenkins highlights how requests to return a looted brass cockerel housed in the Cambridge University Dining Hall came from the university students, not from Nigeria. She argues that recent movements to tear down statues, which originated in 2015 at the University of Cape Town, do, quote, little to advance material and political equality. Jenkins continues that blaming the past for today's troubles robs people of their accountability. Finally, she highlights the complexity of history arguing that we cannot condemn the sacking of Benin without also recognizing that the bronzes were created with wealth from the slave trade. But while she makes some interesting points, I think her arguments are a distraction from the repatriation issue, something Nigeria has been requesting since at least the 1930s. Major museums have come up with a litany of excuses to avoid repatriation over the years. Hicks cites the idea that returning the bronzes would put them in danger, as a particularly hypocritical argument as they weren't necessarily well cared for in European institutions. In recent decades, many museums have claimed to be universal museums for all of humanity. The British Museum long claimed that the artwork shouldn't be repatriated because it would threaten the integrity of universal collection, but Hicks highlights the original intent of anthropological museums as a tool to enforce a colonial worldview which separates, quote, primitive art from European classics. While the purpose of the museum has changed, the collection of looted artworks has not, and so it's increasingly difficult to justify keeping them when the descendants of the original owners are asking for them back. Increasingly, museums are running out of excuses for returning the artworks. Germany has over a thousand looted Benin bronzes in its museum's collections, but Germany has begun returning looted artifacts to Nigeria, returning 20 of them in December 2022. The Humboldt Forum in Berlin stopped exhibiting over 500 bronzes in their collection last year and began preparing them for repatriation. German museums have added to the momentum of the ongoing calls to return the artifacts. France has also returned several artworks to the country of Benin, a former French colony, after a 2017 report commissioned by President Macron investigated the restitution of African artifacts and created a roadmap for restitutions, 
Before the departure of 26 royal treasures from the kingdom of Abomé, the director of the Musée du Quai Vendée in Paris told the newspaper Libération, quote, it is no longer acceptable to display objects acquired through violence. In the UK, the Horniman Museum in London announced late last year that they would return 72 bronzes from their collection to Nigeria. On top of all that, the cover story of the March 2023 issue of National Geographic magazine argues for repatriation of the bronzes. So with all of this momentum, what excuses do the British Museum still have? Well, legally they're forbidden from repatriating items in their collection due to the British Museum Act of 1963. In the past, a few items were returned to Nigeria thanks to a loophole that allowed duplicate items to be returned. But with nearly 1,000 Benin bronzes in their collection, the loophole won't be enough to return them all. Since the law was amended in 2004 to allow for the repatriation of human remains, it could be amended again to allow for restitution, if there's enough political will. Still, we can see some signs of progress, as their most recent website is surprisingly frank about where the bronzes in their collection come from. But even after the British Museum returns the looted bronzes, there are many left in private collections or other museums around the world. The Benin bronzes have gone up for auction throughout the years, with one bronze head fetching $4.7 million at auction in 2007. As recently as 2020, Benin bronzes appeared at major auction houses. One problem is because they were looted before an important 1970 UNESCO convention, their provenance is seen as legitimate, so they are not considered stolen by international law. Dan Hicks estimates there can be as many as 10,000 Benin bronzes scattered around the world. Digital Benin, a project founded by a German museum and art foundation, aims to catalog all known artworks originating in the Kingdom of Benin. It has already amassed images of over 5,000 objects, and has garnered the participation of over 130 museums, including the British Museum. Their websites also feature videos of how the bronzes are made, and oral histories telling, quote, Our story is Benin people the way we want it to be told. I'll put a link in the description so you can check it out. Nigeria already showcases some bronzes in the Nigeria National Museum in Lagos and the Benin City National Museum in Benin City. But some of the most splendid pieces, like the pair of Queen Iova masks currently in London and New York, remain in foreign museums. The Edo Museum of West African Art, designed by renowned Ghanaian British architect Sir David Aje, is being built to house the repatriated artworks in its permanent collection. At the same time, the current Oba, Eware II, is now demanding the bronzes be returned to him and housed in a Benin Royal Museum. Whichever museum they end up at, perhaps one day soon, at least the world's most famous Benin bronzes will return to the land they came from, and the violent act that started 126 years ago can finally start to come to an end, even though it'll never truly finish until all 10,000 artworks are returned. If you want to learn more about the good and bad that happens when two cultures meet, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. Thanks for watching and see you next time.